We're going to talk about reading now. Lainey, what are the questions? They're very concise today, but basic and huge. What is reading? How is reading new this week? Um, how has our attention shifted because of what the materials are this week? You know, what comes to mind when you say that is the discussion before on, on dog ear and how reading, in a sense, uh, the way we read, especially in, in dog ears, it shows us how we actually change the material in the process. Like dog ear is a process of uh, taking a closed text and doing something to remember your place in that closed text. But in that process, we actually change with it. I think I heard it described somewhere as like a quantum type of poetry because it's like a quantum measurement. You know, you try to measure something that's static, but then the process of measuring it changes it. So in a way, maybe maybe this week shows us that, you know, reading isn't just uh, sort of like a passive thing of absorbing that information, but it's a process of like truly interacting and uh, ongoing, evolving and changing the thing out there in the world that we're dealing with. That's I, I love that. Reading isn't passive. It's, it's ongoing and evolving. Thank you so much, Dave. Jake. Yeah, reading isn't passive. That, that's a good uh, point to pick up. I'm not going to read too into it, um, but I, but I kind of want to also. I I mean I I think like just the the, the thing of reading into things uh, this week is is really wonderful and and intense and you know if um, if Erica's work is bringing us into the space um, of of reading like labels on on the card catalog things or or just um, you know, I, again, to to um, come back to her Instagram account, which I mentioned earlier, like it's great, like text that you see on the street, and you suddenly you start reading into it as as like uh, as as poetic. Um, that's that's a pretty awesome just state of mind to be perpetually in, to be on the lookout for this like awesome text, and um, to be on the lookout for meaning that uh, that speaks back to you. Um, so you can kind of constantly just reading stuff that's not on the page, but is the world um, and, and the world of text that is uh, surrounding you and the world of like, um, you know, things that go wrong, um, again, to come back to um, um, Tracy Morris's piece and, 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 and things that are kind of random, but, but you read into them um, and, and it becomes kind of like fun and exciting opportunity for uh, constructing meaning. Fantastic. Yeah, I, you're pointing to this amazing openness of the materials this, this week. We're all barraged by language all the time in so many ways. And if you think of that as an opportunity that poetry is all around us potentially, that makes me think back to Cage's thoughts on music. You know, everything is music, right? So we're shifting our consciousness around what is reading, what is language, and so on. That's really helpful. Thank you, Jake. Um, Kate. I think all poetry illuminates reading as an agreement to agree with what language means and how it works. And so much of the poetry we've seen before week 10, well, particularly before week nine, was about disrupting syntax and grammar and sort of shedding light on the mechanics of our language and how it, it how the mechanics build meaning. But in this week, we're dealing with so many um, familiar texts um, and familiar uses of language that we don't typically think about as having semantic meaning like the airport codes. And it these poets are really showing us the secret histories that are built into these kind of foregone texts. Not the texts aren't foregone, the meanings that we ascribe to them are foregone. We think we know how to read them. Um, so these sort of like ghost presences that exist within and underneath them are coming forward with these chance operations and these sort of, you know, just like, screwing with with these texts 
Unbelievable. Unbelievable. I feel like the beginning of what you said that there's a poem and then it turns into a tiny dissertation of brilliance. Wow. Oh, Thank, Thank you. you so Damn much, it, Kate. Kate. <laughs> Stop being so brilliant. How can we? <laughs> yeah, that that is hard to follow. And I think I want to bring forward something I think I heard Kate saying, which is that um, there's a way in which in weeks nine and ten, we we rethink how we read. And I, I can't help but think about um, Joan Retallick's work. And I feel as though something I've heard her say a lot is is that um, when we encounter texts that are so either very familiar and that we think we know how to read them or completely unfamiliar, you know, and I'm thinking of, of um, texts that feel almost illegible, like we, we don't know how to read this, it then becomes a question of how do you locate your geometries of attention? And it really becomes, you know, reading as an act of, of translating and also as an act of repetition, whereas each time you read or reread something, you're directing your attention on something different and whatever that thing is, I think, changes depending on what the text is and when you're reading the text and the world surrounding the moment that you're reading the text that you're living inside. <laughs> 